Good morning. Today is February 23rd, 2019, and this is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Saturday Science Chat. Today, our special guest is Dennis Allen, and he's going to be talking about why quantum physics works if it's so wrong. So, uh, you can find us on the web at naturalphilosophy.org and uh, join our membership. And we are also on social media. So give us a like on Facebook or check out our YouTube channel. If you'd like to help us out, uh, we invite you to join Basecamp and uh, participate in doing things. And the rules of conduct for this chat is that we treat everyone with respect with no personal attacks. Please keep your comments uh, restricted to science. And uh, I have our, we have our upcoming conference in uh, the University of Washington, June 26th through the 29th. So we hope that uh, you'll consider coming. And our Lifetime Achievement Award is going to go to Dr. Gerald Pollack. So today uh, we have Dennis Allen. So Dennis, why don't you tell us uh, what you've got, got for us today? Well, uh... At the end of my last talk, or no, not, uh, at the end of a, a recent talk, maybe last week, uh, Harry Ricker uh, made the comment about how quantum mechanics doesn't make sense. It's uh, built up from axioms that don't seem to reflect reality in all cases. And, and I pointed out to him that, uh, but they do have supercomputers, the World Wide Web, and stuff like this, which is hard to ignore. And, basically said something like, I uh, know, or something. But that gave me the idea, maybe uh, it would be good to explain why uh, quantum mechanics uh, gives you supercomputers and World Wide Web and so on, when, when it's crazy. If you look at it carefully, and it doesn't always agree with the experiment either. Well, uh, to do that, I'm going to have to uh, start out with a uh, a, a, a book by uh, Beiser, uh, Arthur Beiser, Concepts of Modern Physics, Fourth Edition. Uh, this is about uh, 20 or 25 years old, but uh, it's just uh, the basics haven't changed in that time, really. Uh, that's one of the things that critical thinkers don't like about the current paradigm is, is that uh, in the past, paradigms came and went. Now, uh, they seem to be determined to defend their paradigm of uh, the uh, relativistic electrodynamics, of uh, ge general relativity, of uh, standard model uh, to the death. Uh, so uh, let's uh, consider uh, one of the key things uh, in quantum mechanics, and that is the electron theory. Uh, Dennis, uh, what was the name of that book that you re referenced? Uh, the book uh, cover is the last page in this file that we're talking about. It'll give you all the information you need. It's, uh, uh, fundamentals? I have a copy of Perspectives of Modern Physics by Beiser. That's well, not what you're talking about. Uh, that's probably more recent. Uh, uh, but this is Concepts of Modern Physics. But they're, they're all... You know, they're all basically the same because we're discussing uh, foundations, uh, which is uh, Bohr's quantum, uh, Copenhagen quantum mechanics, uh, as, uh, you know, propped up uh, and uh, extended by Paul Dirac. And uh, also in the link for the uh, science chat this week, uh, there's a link to all the files that uh, Dennis will be referring to. So if, you, if you're interested in looking at that further, uh, he's got the six papers that are in this, that zip file that I attached to the meeting announcement. Okay, so uh, let's turn to pages 240 and 241. Okay, Biden. so you need to share your screen, Dennis. Uh, all right, just a minute. I'll see what I can do here. Yeah, here's uh, page 240 on my screen. Can you see it? Uh, first, you have to click on the share uh -huh. on the bottom. 
and then say share screen. Share menu. Okay, yeah. How's that? Okay, we can see your screen. Now show your the paper that you want us to see. Okay. Um, there we go. We can see it now. Okay, now uh, there's uh, three sets of quantum numbers uh, on board theory. There's uh, uh, I can't think of it at the moment, but there's just there's three sets of numbers, and they're governed by axiom. Uh, the number we're interested in here is on the top of this page 240. Uh, uh, this is a space quantization of electron spin. It's described by the spin magnetic quantum number m sub s. We call it the orbital angular momentum vector can have two L plus one orientations in a magnetic field from minus L to plus L. Similarly, the spin angular momentum vector can have two S plus one equals uh, two orientations equals two orientations specified by M equals plus one half and N equals uh, you know, you know, for a moment, Dennis. What? And that. Uh, so on our screens, we can see it, but this text is very small. Uh, is there a, like a magnify option so you can make the screen, the text bigger on your screen? No, you're talking about uh, talking to someone who doesn't know computing very well. Uh, uh, probably if you right click, it would probably bring up a menu for magnify or something. Uh, Let's see. What does it say? Uh, no, that's not it. No. Uh, maybe click down towards the bottom. If you're using a PDF reader. An easier way to do it might be to hold down the control key and tap the plus sign. You know, I've got something that's if you're on a Mac that works. Well, it works. It works in uh, Windows as well. Is Usually, in most browser browsers, whether it's Internet Explorer or Firefox or Chrome, they all do the same thing. So press the control key and uh, just hold the hold down the control key and and then tap the plus key, and it usually will enlarge whatever you're looking at in the browser. Uh, I've got uh, this menu. I've got two copies of this menu on my screen. I don't know how to get rid of. Them. Yeah, uh, press the escape key or just click anywhere else on the screen outside of that menu. No, it doesn't work. No. Now try page up and down. <laughs> page up and down. Where's that? Uh, oh, wait. Now I, now I got rid of it. Yeah, you got rid of it. It's okay. If you can't, you can't magnify it, we can still see. Well, actually, there's a plus sign that just showed up on the right-hand side of your screen. What happened? You go click on that. <laughs> you see, uh, there was a plus sign that showed up briefly there. Um, yeah, I missed that. Well, uh, it's okay. You can just go ahead and explain it. All right. Well, uh, there, it boils down to this: there's two uh, orientations the magnetic spin vector can take if you have a, 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 a field. Where the field lines are parallel to the z axis there. You're either at uh, s equals the cube root, square root of 3 divided by 2h, where h is uh, plan, uh, one of Planck's constants. And uh, uh, the other one is the negative, the reflection in the x axis, so to speak. Now, uh, this is just comes out of the quantum number stuff. Uh, it doesn't seem, it, and it's justified earlier by it gives the right spectra some in certain cases, not all cases. So uh, why would uh, the spin magnetic vector be essentially at 45 degrees or minus 45 degrees from the the uh, 
direction of the ambient uh, magnetic field? Well, uh, they don't say it just is. That's the way it is. But uh, why is it that way? Well, it seems to me that really the magnetic spin vector should be parallel to the uh, electric field and anti-parallel, of course. They come in pairs since you've got uh, symmetry with respect to reflection in the x-axis. Uh, so uh, we don't need to only consider one of the two because the other comes by reflection. Uh, well, one thing that could happen is, is since this whole thing is spinning, we've got a two-dimensional uh, cross-section here. So the, uh, the magnetic spin vector spins around the z-axis, apparently. Uh, although, you know, they, you have to take this with a grain of salt. They say we don't really believe that this electron spins. It's a point particle. So <laughs> they leave you in limbo, so to speak. But anyway. Uh, well, Alan, uh, Dennis, I got a question for you. Yeah. How is, are we talking about spin versus magnetic spin, or are they the same thing? Or are they different? That, uh, there's a terminology issue here. Uh, the equation 7.2 gives the spin angular momentum, which is one half times eight Planck's constant, one of Planck's constants. And then the next page, 7.3 gives the spin magnetic moment, which is, as a vector, is a uh, anti-parallel to the uh, uh, spin that we just discussed. Okay, so there are two things. There's the there's the spin vector, and then there's the magnetic moment of the spin. Yeah. All right, okay. And they're, co they're parallel or anti-parallel. Since it's a negative charge in electron, I guess they're anti-parallel. The spin is, but the magnetic moment is is 45 degrees to the spin, spin axis, is what this uh, drawing shows. Well, if it were root 2, it would be. <coughs> okay, so what you have is the spins are plus and minus one half h. Yeah, and this is a projection on the z axis. The actual spin is uh, root 3 over 2 h. Uh, that's the magnetic spin. Yeah, uh, let's see what it says here. Uh, spin angular momentum on 7.2. Spin angular right, momentum. That's the angular momentum of the spin, and then you have the magnetic. Yeah, that's um, uh, 7.3 on the next page. I agree this is confusing because, you know, the word spin appears in both things, but the spin yeah. is different. Well, what is a magnetic uh, uh, in uh, dimension, dimensionality, and the other is uh, uh, has uh, dimensions of uh, angular momentum. So the dimensionalities are different. Now, uh, the, the thing is. Uh, the uh, spin vector and the magnet and the, the angular momentum spin vector and the spin magnetic moment vector are anti-parallel. So, uh, or parallel, perhaps. I think anti-parallel. And uh, so, uh, uh, what we have, what we see in this diagram on page 240, is that uh, uh, could be interpreted that the uh, since the thing is presumably spinning around the z-axis, could be interpreted as uh, wobbling, uh, like a top that uh, is not in the sleeping position where the spin is vertical. Instead, it it uh, it, it wobbles around uh, the vertical, uh, assuming that the uh, lower pivot is fixed. And uh, so you could uh, explain this as well uh, by uh, assuming that uh, the, the electron wobbles as it, uh, as far as the spin vector is concerned, as it, like a top. 
All right, now, uh, down at the bottom of page 241, they give an outline, a drawing of the stern gear like experiment, which is supposed to approve this beyond a doubt. Uh, you can see here that uh, uh, you have silver atoms, which have supposedly one free electron, and that's where the magnetic moment comes from. However, uh, uh, the, uh, there are uh, electrons which are not free, but they're randomly distributed. And there's pro protons and neutrons, too, that are spinning in the nucleus, but uh, the proton and the neutron have extremely small magnetic moment in comparison with the electron. Because the mat in the formula for the magnetic moment, the mass is in the denominator, and a proton, for example, is over 1,800 times more massive than an electron. So that's why they can just worry about the silver free electron and, and push the rest out of their mind. All right, now we see here it comes out of an oven. That means it's hot. And uh, you drive this beam between these two strange magnets, strange shaped magnets. And uh, if the thing was ever going to wobble, you know, the hot means there's a lot of uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, energy and in the form of heat radiation inside the system. And uh, so if it was ever going to wobble, it certainly would wobble at this high temperature. Furthermore, the energy in a gas, an ideal gas, uh, is uh, proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. So uh, it, the energy really goes up with the temperature. And, uh, uh, excuse me. So uh, if this, you know, it's not too, wouldn't be too surprising if this, these electrons were wobbling a little bit because of all the heat, uh, you know, it's sort of like, think of a, a field of wheat about ready to harvest and a gusty wind blowing along the wheat. It, it would bow when the wind, it would bow in the opposite direction, in the same the direction that the wind is coming from uh, because, uh, uh, you know, it's it's not rigid. The stalks of wheat are not rigid, but they, the, the close by ones tend to behave about the same as each other. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, it looks to me like what's happening is is that the heat, uh, radi the the uh, infrared uh, that's in there, uh, because of the fact that these silver atoms are coming out hot out of an oven uh, makes these things wobble pretty badly. And uh, so then uh, on the average, which is what you get in a deal like this, an average reading, you would have uh, quite a bit of uh, angle with the uh, yeah. And uh, uh, you know, you could you can do a, think of it as a top and do calculations and so on, but I'm just trying to get you in the right ballpark here. So uh, that, what seems to be happening here is that, uh, yes, uh, the uh, average uh, angle is about 45 degrees, but uh, uh, it's not because of some weird quantum number. It's because of heat, a lot of heat. Now, uh, you know, there's all sorts of qu quantum numbers and everything for larger particles than electrons, but they all have extremely small magnetic moments. Uh, and what counts the gravy in, uh, in uh, solid-state physics is electrons and how they operate, you know. Uh, and uh, they uh, build chips and use lasers and so on, uh, which means that the, everything is hot, you know. And uh, so uh, it looks to me like this is, uh, that there's a hidden variable here, and it's, it's uh, the infrared uh, that's involved in all this.
Now, uh, that, that's maybe an interesting idea, but what about numbers? Well, next uh, we'll go to uh, a theoretical explanation of the anomalous magnetic crane monsoon effect using the idea, idea of a dipole gas. Should I bring that up on my computer if I can? Uh, yeah, just yeah, go just ahead and bring it up. You'll see anything that you do. Okay. Okay, we just uh, start on page one here. What, what is uh, the crane monsoon magnetic effect? Well, if you take a cylindrical permanent magnet that's strong, you know, say a niodium, niodium uh, iron boron uh, type uh, super magnet, uh, which is a permanent magnet, it may have niodium, iron, and boron, of course. Uh, then, uh, and assume that it's uh, rotated so the lines of magnetic field inside the mm -hmm. cylinder are parallel to the Z axis, which is also the spin axis. Uh, so, uh, you, uh, uh, excuse me a second, I gotta drink the water. Uh, so, uh, suppose you spin the thing at a constant angular velocity, what happens to the pole strength of this permanent magnet? Well, it turns out that if you rotate in one direction, uh, the magnetic pole strength increases, whereas if you rotate it in the other direction, it decreases. Now, why could this be? Well, that's, uh... Uh, the idea what is... What axis are you rotating it? The axis. The axis that's axial with the length of the cylinder? Yeah. The cylindrical axis is also the spin axis. All right. Uh, so, uh, how do I explain this? Well, uh, first, uh, do a, a simplification. Uh, let's assume that uh, all the, uh, pro see, how would you make one of these things? Well, you you make up this alloy and have it liquid in a cylindrical mold, and you apply a huge magnetic field parallel to the cylindrical axis, and then you let it cool until it's solidified, thereby locking in all the free electrons that are being held in place before the cooling by this uh, really strong magnetic field parallel to the spin axis. So uh, uh, then, uh, because of the structure of the alloy molecules, all these uh, pre were formerly free electrons get more or less locked in parallel to the uh, spin axis. Now, if you think about it, uh, if you think of, visualize uh, uh, what uh, I suppose I should talk here a minute about my uh, electron modeling, about Dave Berman and my electron modeling. It's basically a toroid that's very, very thin. Uh, it's like three, roughly three times ten to the minus uh, 199 or 198, I forget which, uh, time uh, uh, in uh, a small radius. But it's uh, quite a bit bigger, 10 to the minus 13, and it's large radius. You know, a toroid has two radiuses, like it's a donut, basically. So uh, I assume that there is, I divide this uh, magnetic up into uh, cubic uh, cells, uh, and uh, I uh, put one 
electron in each cell. And uh, then I arrange the uh, dimension of the cell so that the numbers come out right. That is, you don't have too much charge or too, you don't have too much magnetic field or too little and so on. So uh, then the question is, uh, we'll rotate this thing and see what happens to uh, the magnetic field. Now, I think at this point, I, I may be losing a few people. So are there any questions before we go on? Yes. Uh, what's the name of this? Are there any other references? Uh, it's uh, the name is a theoretical explanation of the anomalous magnetic crane Einstein effect using the idea of a dipole gas. So we're talking about the crane Einstein effect. That's right. And Never heard of that. Yeah, let's uh, go to the last page of this. And the last paragraph, the interested reader is referred to the free ebook Central Oscillator and Space Quantum Medium by O. Crane, J. M. Lerner, and C. Monstein on Han Lerner's website, where Hans is the late J. C. Lerner's son. And the magnet used was a sophisticated uh, uh, niodium iron boron magnet. See page 230 for an exact write up of this experiment. Uh, they use a space quantum flux, but I don't think that's what that's uh, So, uh, That'll, that'll give you, that's a free ebook, and you can, uh, John, uh, uh, or at least it was formerly on the late J. C. Lerner's son's, his name is Hans, website. Okay, now any other questions? Nope, go on. Okay, well, uh, but to, to get to uh, putting one electron in each cell, uh, I first have to uh, use the idea of a dipole gas. That is, every particle in the gas, they're infinitesimally small, point particles, if you like, every particle is a little tiny uh, dipole. And uh, there are two, two formulas for dipole. One is the A formula, A being the uh, magnetic. Are we talking about magnetic dipoles or electric yeah, dipoles? Right, magnetic dipoles. Okay, Everything. so magnetic dipole. Yeah, and uh, each point is a little magnetic dipole. However, there are two key formulas for dipoles, magnetic dipoles, and that is uh, the first one is in the form of the usual B field. The second one is in the form of the, the A field, which is that you have to take curl A to get B, where curl is a vector operator. So uh, at first I tried in the B field, but that I got only singularities that I couldn't get rid of. So I went from to the A field and then Towards the end, after I computed the A field in general, I would take the curl, only one of which uh, comp vector components, uh, three, three vector components would be non-zero. And so I, I got the B field, not directly, but indirectly through the A field. And uh, I might mention that uh, James Wesley in his book, uh, uh, Scientific Physics, his last solo book, uh, points out that uh, B field does not seem to be the right field for magnetics, but the A field seems to be the right one. And he has a whole chapter on it, two chapters, I believe, on that. All right, let, uh, let's uh, let's uh, pause here if we could. Yeah. Um, B is not magnetic field. H is magnetic field. B well, is yeah. magnetic. Density. 
Yeah, I know, but... Uh, and uh, this is where the whole thing gets really messed up because the mainstream says B is magnetic field, and it's not magnetic field. It's magnetic flux, field yeah. flux. Mm -hmm. And so the whole thing gets messed up. And um, But are you using... But usually what they do is they derive the magnetic field of a loop a cur of a dipole from a current loop. Is that what you're doing? Uh, no, I'm taking the formula. First, I took the formula for the B field out of Foundations of Electromagnetic Theory, uh, uh, Reach and Milford. Uh, they may do it in terms of a circular loop. I don't recall anymore. I took that course in 62-63 uh, uh, academic year. Uh, but uh, that didn't work out, so I took the, the formula for the A field. They have one there, too. And uh, that's probably also from a, a loop. I don't know. But uh, uh, this one uh, worked. And as I say, the reason is that uh, the, uh, the B or the H field, or whichever one you want to talk about, uh, is uh, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. I may have a drink of water. Okay, well, the A field is what is called a vector potential, yeah, potential. which is analogous to the voltage in an yeah. electric circuit. So you have potential, okay. Yeah. And then you take the gradient of the elect of the potential, the vector potential field for electricity, and you get E. And then supposedly you take the the A curl of A, which is the A is the vector potential yeah. Yeah. for magnetism. And so they're supposed to be analogous, but you know that's not really very analogous in my opinion. No, I'm a that's why I did. I don't want to get into. Uh, all I want to do is say that. Uh, yeah. Well, we don't want to. I understand you don't want to get into all of the, the nonsense of of how these vector fields are calculated because that's very confusing. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the thing is, is that uh, you know the B and H field are usually the ones that everybody uh, says are the magnetic ones. But the, uh, uh, it turns out that, that uh, since the curl is not a one-to-one -one function, that information is lost when you take the curl of A to get B. And that information many times is irrelevant, but sometimes not. And this is one of those times. All right, now uh, let's scroll down here. Now, uh, well, you have to have a gauge condition is usually what they do. Yeah, but uh, I don't go with gauge theory. I, I do not. Neither does Webster. Well, the gauge condition is what supposedly is put in there to replace that missing information. Yeah, well, I don't think so, though. Uh, All right. Well, okay, go on. <laughs> okay. So, uh, now, uh, so I start out and compute. Assuming that the cylinder is full of uh, these tiny dipole things, they're all lined up uh, in, pointed in the positive Z axis direction. I, I calculate uh, some things. Uh, uh, okay. So you're talking about your dipoles are in embedded inside the solid magnet, right? It's not yeah, I'm a trying to get, gas beam, but I'm trying to get to uh, putting one electron in each cell, but the, you can't, you've got to argue a little bit that that's conceivable and it doesn't give you a wrong number. So uh, I compute the A field here on page, I don't know what page we're on, six. Up near the top, this is the A field to do a dipole gas assuming doubly infinite cylindrical magnet. That is, in other words, what I'm doing is uh, forgetting about edge and end effects. Uh, then I introduce cylindrical coordinates because we actually do have a cylinder here. 
Yeah, uh, compute various other things connected with the dipole gas and, and uh, the relationship between that and the magnetic field of the cylinder was full of dipole gas now. And, uh, well, how is this, uh, Dennis? Yeah. How is this different from the, basically the mainstream view of a magnet is that it contains these little domains, which are, in fact, magnetic dipoles? You know, what, what is commonly shown is that a, a large uh, permanent magnet is just a bunch of tiny little dipole magnets all glued together. And that's all they say a magnet is. Is, is that concept any different than what you're proposing here? Uh, well, uh, what I'm proposing is, is that they start out with this alloy, uh, niodium, uh, iron, and boron. They liquefy it here just above the uh, melting point. Put a large magnetic field in place to line all the uh, free electrons up and then cool it. Slowly, so and you don't then they're locked in. So it makes sense to use a dipole gas to uh, talk about this to start with, because you don't know any dimensions. But dipole gases have no dimension; they're full of point dipoles, which are we assume are lined up parallel to the z-axis. Well, see, I would call that more a dipole solid. Yeah, because the gas kind of implies that all the particles are uh, available to move freely in any which direction, and clearly they're not uh, able to do that in a permanent magnet. They're they're locked into a solid. So I'm just kind of questioning why would you call this a dipole gas? Well, I mean, really uh, a dipole against solid. The gas is assumed to be lined up in the right direction every single little bit. Yeah, I'm going to tell you, gases don't do that. Gases are no, totally... No, no, but I'm not using gas theory. I'm just using the concept of an ideal gas. I do not use uh, ideal gas theory. Uh, I'm just saying I think it's confusing because it has really nothing to do with a gas. Nothing in the well, ideal gas theory has any applicability to something which is, which seems to me to be clearly a solid. Yes, it is a solid, but here's the thing. Uh, if, if I can start out and if I can compute uh, how the uh, see all these dipole bits uh, that are lined up have the same uh, dipole moment, magnetic dipole moment. So uh, if I can compute uh, the magnetism, magnetic uh, effect of a cylinder filled with these tiny bits lined up. Uh, where, you know, there, uh, every single point is one of these dipoles. Then, then I can uh, uh, figure out how the uh, dipole moment, con whatever it is, uh, DM or DMM or whatever it is, uh, it is in real, you know, how the, the value of D DMM or what DM, whatever, is uh, related to the uh, pole strength of your cylinder filled with dipole gas. So what is the result? What is your conclusion? Well, let's see. Uh, the A field is on page... Uh, uh, Although I'm sure most of us won't be able to follow the math, but intuitively, yeah, uh, so, what is the cause of this decrease or increase in magnetic field? Uh, equation uh, 29. I can, uh, this is uh, B3, it's uh, DMM dot mu zero. It comes out amazingly simple. For DMM, I think it's the magnetic moment of uh, each bit, dipole bit, mu zero is, everyone, you know, that's one of the permeability of empty space. So I get a simple relation. Let me see if I can get DMM nailed down here. I had DM and DMM. And, uh, I mean, 
three, we're all we're all curious as to why we have this effect where you take the magnet and you spin it, and it uh, becomes uh, more powerful in one direction and less powerful in another. I mean, that's certainly an interesting uh, effect. Yeah. But uh, so I'm still that, not understanding that, that, why you think that. That, that, that Monstein thrown in jail, by the way. Uh, he, they they hired an attorney from the university, and they got a court order that if, if he had divulged any information, he, he could be jailed or at least heavily fined. But anyway, uh, that's the one. Because basically, you've got these dipoles. And they're all lined up along the pole, and you spin them around. Now, in my mind, I don't think that should change the magnetic field to anything, right? Well, consider, you know, could, consider the z-axis coming out of the screen now instead of being vertical. Okay? Franklin? Yes? Let's assume that the z-axis, we've got a, the cylinder is coming out of the screen, and the z-axis which is this axis of symmetry that's coming out of the screen. Uh, now uh, imagine inside the, the cylinder, but towards the edge, a circle, a little circle, which is uh, my, my Dave Bergman and my electron. All right, now if the, if the thing spins at a constant angular velocity, uh, the closer side of the circle to the uh, axis uh, uh, has the same angular velocity as the far side of the circle. However, the out moment arm is slightly greater. That's just between one side of the electron to the other you're talking about. Yeah, across the, uh, the diameter of the toroid, uh, the, uh, you can see uh, that the, uh, the, the, mo the moment arm uh, for the near side of the electron to the z-axis coming out of the screen, uh, has a less of an effect, rotational effect, than the outer, if you extend the line through the center of the far end out to the edge, uh, far edge, uh, that, that is getting more spin velocity, not angular velocity, but linear velocity, than the inside. So there's a slight discrepancy here. You see what yeah, I'm but that effect would be the same whether, no matter which direction you were rotating, right? No, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, draw a diagram. Now that would totally, I mean, if, if you've got uh, electrons that says torus that's spinning around an axis, then it wouldn't matter whether you were spinning left or spinning right, that difference between the, uh, the, the width of the electron would have uh, the same effect. I, I can't see there be anything different. Calculations and see if you can accept them. I mean, intuitively, I just know that that's true. Well, I know it, but you know, sometimes our intuitions lead us astray. But how can it be different? How well, can how I can it be? I just do the math, man. Well, math can lie, and oftentimes does. All right. See now. Uh, Okay, now here, um, on page 14, uh, I have the formula for the current, EV over 4 delta X. I've had to, I've had to go from an uh, electron in the cell to the cell itself, which is a, a cube of uh, delta X length, one edge. See, if we, we set the range magnetic moment equal to the square's magnetic moment, so if they look the same, from a distance where we picture the ring center as at the square center as well. And also the ring circle of symmetry is in the XY plane. Thus if we consider the square of side delta X and the ring center at the square center, they should both have the same magnet be the same magnetically from they look the same magnetically from a distance as they should. You know, I add these two things up and I don't get zero. Uh, and I solve. Well, maybe this is 
That's the best one, you know, they pay. Uh, yeah, well, uh, got me rattled, though. Oh, God, I know I'm going to do it. Oh, here we go, here we go. Sorry, it's on page 50, page 55. I had the, the velocity of the charge, uh, I'm using a square now, not a circle. Uh, and the, the uh, from the uh, spin axis to the square center is, uh, A rho is the uh, the uh, cylindrical coordinate of the uh, center of the uh, square. So I have to subtract delta x, which is the edge length, over 2, since uh, from the center it's only halfway to the edge. And on the other hand, I, I add on the other hand, but then the v subtract, because uh, the, the current is going in opposite direction the top and the bottom. I don't talk about the side because they're basically parallel to uh, the uh, radius vector from the, uh, the you know, spin axis. So they don't really enter in either way. And I add them up and I do not get zero. I get 56. Excuse me, could I just interject a, a somewhat yeah, tangential yeah. question? Um, you, you have here, sir, the um, speed of the current flow. Could yeah. I ask, what is that? Is that just um, diffusion of electrons, or what speed is that? Uh, it's a uh, it's, uh, current is not conducted by electrons in this paper. Current is the ch change of charge that goes by a point per unit time, where charge is a, uh, we have two undefined terms in this theory. One is a positive charge, the other is negative charge, and they're related by Columns law. So what, what's the magnitude of that um, speed? Uh, let's see, let's go down here, I calculated it a little later. I mean, is it roughly of the order of the speed of light, or is it... Um, oh, no, it's uh, much slower, because these electrons really are tiny inside these cubes. Let's see. Uh, it, it, it's not the sort of very, very slow uh, electron oh, no, fusion that we talk about. Yeah. It, is it that? I mean, you know, like sort of... Um, uh, in inches per per minute or something like that, you know the very very slow diffusion. Yeah, yeah. The, the real velocity of electrons through wires is extremely small. There's no question about it. Now, where is it? where do I compute the damn? Okay, thank you. Uh, Someone sees it, help me out here. My eyes are going to be crushed. So, Cornelius, you had a question? Well, uh, Dennis is looking at that. Maybe you can ask him that. Well, it was not so much of a question. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, it's not so much of a question as it was it probably kind of goes along with what uh, Ian is asking too. 
uh, and that's basically a simplification of uh, why the uh, magnetic strength would increase or decrease depending on which way you spin it. Yeah. Uh, I would say it has more to do with like the, the eddy current within the magnet, uh, because anything that you're, you're, you know, all eddy currents exist in, in magnetics, magnetics or in metal. Uh, but basically, if you just look at it from the standpoint, if you uh, have a uh, magnetic loop or, or, or a ring, uh, a loop uh, of wire, and you run the electrons in one direction, you get a north-south uh, perpendicular to the direction of the, of the flow of the electricity. And if you reverse the flow of electricity, you get a south-north. So those same electrons, there, there are some free electrons within that magnetic material. It's inescapable. There is always going to be some free electrons within anything. Those electrons are being drug around by the rotation of the magnet. And by virtue of that, essentially, you have an electromagnet within a mechanical magnet. And the direction of the electron flow is going to either oppose, or the magnetic field generated by the electron flow is going to either oppose or augment the uh, existing magnetic field at the permanent magnet part. And yeah. that would be why it would increase or decrease. Yeah, but we want numbers here. We don't want hand waving. Okay, I'm just, I, I'm not giving you hand waving. I'm just giving you the theory of why you're you're where your numbers are coming from. Yeah, that's right. I, all right, now number fifty four, ninety four point five three eight uh, meters per second is the velocity v that you were some or other was asking me about. So it's far from the speed of light, as you can see. What's that? M meters per second. What are the units there? Meters per second. Okay, thank you. This is the MKS system. Except well, that when we get to the end, it turns out that they uh, you switch to a different system, which we have to then transfer back to our system to get their data to about right, you know. So uh, anyway, so uh, when you do the math, it turns out that it does depend on the direction of rotation. And the reason why is that what, what the gentleman just said, that probably uh, that's most of it anyway. But uh, anyway, uh, I don't want to, it's almost uh, time for questions and answers. Uh, so, uh, what, what numbers do I get? How close are my numbers? Well, the, uh, I get about 5.5%, 5.5% 5, 5 of, of, uh, increase in, uh, because I'm spinning in the direction where it increases. I get 5.5384669122 as a percent increase. Now, is this within their, uh, air, margin of error? Yes. Just barely, though. They get 9.8%, and I get plus or minus 4.5%, and subtracting 4.5 from 9.8, get 5.3, so I'm, I get 5.53 instead of 5.3, so I'm in the uh, experimental error here. So you know, I have explained this. Uh, within the limits of their experimental error. However, I point out that uh, if you do the math, uh, the uh, pole strength does not increase uniformly around the pole. Uh, as you get out towards the edge of the pole, or towards the sun, uh, you know, the edge of the, think of the pole as a, uh, as a disc, uh, infinitely thin uh, a circle with the uh, interior, uh, it it uh, goes way up and goes way down uh, when you get uh, almost to the spin axis. Now they didn't know this apparently because they had had a good theoretical explanation. They were talking about space quantum flux. I have no idea what that means, uh, but uh, so they would be measuring with their probe, we'd have to know what their probe looked like, but 
If it was a little tiny sensitive thing, they might not, but probably it was bigger. And so they pick up the uh, higher uh, magnetic field and when it's spinning, it occurs at the edge of, of the pole. Uh, and so that would explain why I'm just barely within the margin of error here. I think that that's my opinion. You can get this, this it's not a free ebook. That's that's a lie. They give you an expert excerpt that's free, but you have to buy the thing. And if you speak German, that the German edition would be the one to buy. I, I, I studied German in college, but that was in the years of 60 through 62. I don't remember a lot. But uh, you can, uh, you know, look into this. All right, now, relating this back to the stern gerlach experiment, it seems clear that uh, you, you might say, well, what about this? Why, you know, if you're measuring at room temperature, which is what this was measured at, I found out, uh, then why didn't you, you get some wobbling, which would make you, your uh, when you measured it, the wobbling would tend to decrease the uh, effect because then the, uh, spin, the magnetic dipole axis and the spin axis, both in anti-parallel, would uh, a lot of it be canceled by the wobbling. Uh, the answer seems to be that uh, I have a drink of water here. The answer seems to be that uh, what we've got here is a super magnet, a special alloy of uh, niodium, iron, and boron. Apparently, when they cool it and under it, well, it's under a tremendously strong magnetic field, it locks in on just about all the uh, free electrons in one direction, of course. And so there isn't going to be a lot of wobbling in the case of a, a super magnet. But if you talk about uh, solid state physics, that's, you know, that this that wouldn't be the case. You would expect a lot more wobbling in that case than uh, in this case. And uh, as I say, they work with lasers and so on, which are hot. It looks to me, quite frankly, that the reason that uh, uh, Bohr's theory worked out so well, practically, is first of all, it only all he's got to do is get electrons right, and that's where the gravy is. That's where solid state physics is. Uh, as I said, the protons have essentially, uh, because you'd have to divide by the proton mass rather than the electron mass, you'd be dividing by 1800, which is quite a large figure for this. Uh, so, uh, uh, this, uh, this, what I've just said seems to explain uh, solid, why solid state physics gives so much good stuff and why the, the theory is, is, Bohr's theory is found wrong in a lot of cases experimentally. Uh, it's just uh, the fact that somehow Bohr in his theory took into account, without realizing it probably, the hidden variable, which is heat, which is uh, you know, a, a, a cubic meter of gas, the uh, internal energy goes off as T to the fourth power, or T temperature, and it starts from absolute zero. And uh, so uh, this, so this seems to be just about it. Uh, if if uh, the if they have these other uh, with the except, possible exception of nuclear weapons, uh, uh, which they would have to go into the Bohr uh, theory for nuclei. Uh, and and uh, so there, I would, uh, you know, a thorough explanation of why Bohr's theory works, or which as adjusted by Dirk, would have to uh, talk about nuclei and so on, which, but, but the real, you know, and then of course you have nuclear reactors too. 
But the real gravy in, uh, in quantum mechanics is the electron theory, in my opinion. Well, it's uh, my... Well, but, but Dennis, I'm not sure that we've really looked... I mean, we've looked at things about the stern gerlach experiment. We've looked at things about uh, magnetic field. Um, but I still don't feel that we've looked at anything about the Bohr theory, which has to do with the electron levels, per se. So, like I said, you've talked about things like magnetic moment. But how do you explain the specific spectra generated by the helium atom, for example? That is something which is very specifically predicted by the Bohr model. Uh, yes, uh, but here again, that's that's not uh, when we talk about how well uh, the Bohr model works, as updated by Dirk. Uh, you you bring out you have to try out first uh, uh, computers and uh, the World Wide Web and uh, Oh, but sort of things like that don't really rely upon war theory so much, you know. Uh, the, that the, that that the that the helium spectra looks the way it is. Has, you know, we don't use that at all in designing uh, computer circuits, pretty much. There will uh, be some do, however, use a great installed state electronics to determine that. About By like war theory, uh, he means that the electron spins around the nucleus. Yeah, that's that's what that would be Bohr's theory about electrons spinning around the nucleus, because as uh, many people have pointed out, uh, if they did spin around the nucleus, they'd radiate all their energy according to Maxwell's yeah. equation. The, the Bohr the Bohr theory does exist somewhat in that stern garlic experiment. The information about it in the what experiment? In the Stern Gerlach, the, the the experiment oh, that he Stern showed. Stern Gerlach, okay. Yeah, the, yeah, it show it's there, there's some information in that that indicates uh, the Bohr atom characteristics. Uh, if you, in in my view anyway, if you look at the uh, diagram where it's showing, uh, you know, the classical pattern and the actual pattern. If I don't know if you want to put that back up on the screen or not. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah. Well, it shows that uh, there are only two states of magnetic. Correct. Yeah, and, and and that basically is showing that there is a you know a a quantization or a locked-in characteristic where you don't get the randomness in all the in-between characteristics, but you have a a a, 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 a orbital level or a level. Uh, I agree. I agree that. Electrons in an atom don't necessarily need to orbit entirely around the atom. Uh, but what you do have is if the electron is on one side of the silver atom or the other, uh, it will be more strongly affected by the magnet than if it's just randomly scattered throughout the uh, 360 degree locations of the thing. So what happens is as it's moving through that magnet, the electron will snap to one side or the other, depending on the spin of the electron. And it, it'll remain in its orbit, but it'll go in that, or it'll remain in, it in its shell. But within that shell, it will move around the nucleus because it can't go through the nucleus. It will go around the nucleus to either one side or the other. And that going around and, and, and being in that specific shell all the way around is why we get a specific line drawn and not the haziness in between because it can't go in between there's an at there's a nucleus there so there, i think that there kind of demonstrates some of the bohr atom characteristics that's, now, that's my view on that. things, i think we're getting things confused because the spin is a characteristic of just an electron i mean theoretically you should be able to do the stern gerlach experiment with a beam of just electron and i think that would actually be the more proper experiment so you can separate out the effects between atoms and electrons. So that's what it's but it's but the thing is the point is that it's not being done with just an electron, it's being done with a silver atom, which does have all that mass, and therefore you get that characteristic. If it were done with just an electron, would you get the same characteristic as it hasn't been done with just an electron? Well, actually, curiously enough, some people have claimed that they have actually done that experiment. And that yes. was my biggest big bugaboo about Sterlank Gerlach. 
is that you're not measuring the properties of an electron, you're measuring the properties of a silver atom, exactly. which I would agree to you is totally dipole, right? right? And I totally agree with you that what's going on there is that the electron is just like going to one side or the other, creating a very lopsided dipole. And therefore that is that whole spin thing is a characteristic of a whole atom, not anything having to do with individual electrons. But uh, um, someone did seem to claim that they did actually do this experiment with only electrons and they showed that it still showed it had this uh, quantum splitting effect. So I'm not yeah. sure I believe them, but that that would be, you know, in contrast to how I wouldn't expect I wouldn't expect yeah. the pattern to be the same if there were no nucleus in there. But I don't think I would, this has I would expect this. I would expect theory. the pattern to still to, to still show a non not non spherical pattern. I would expect it to still deflect either upwards or downwards, more of a, a vertical line than I than this. But I wouldn't expect it to show a uh, a spherical pattern or, or or a classical pattern of any kind where it was randomly placed. It would still go in a in a perpendicular or horizontal, I'm not sure which it would be, right? I have handed up thinking totally through a uh, line on the screen. Well, I want to ask Dennis, so you seem to think that the heating in the oven seems to have something to do with this. Now, in my mind, that when you heat things, that randomizes things more. So that, that to me doesn't explain why is it these beams split off in exactly two directions. To me, if heat had anything to do with it, that would make them split off in like every direction. It should just be a fuzzy dot. Uh, but how do you how are you thinking that the heat causes them to split into these two separate beams? Uh, because uh, it causes uh, wobbling, uh, like a top. If you spin it, and uh, you don't start out with a spin axis being vertical. Yeah, like, so I'm saying that if so you're wobbling, I mean, that will encourage it to go in every direction. Uh, but we don't see that. We see the opposite of that. We see the wobbling causing it to go in only two directions. Yes, well, wait a second. I think the wobbling is a statistical distribution which has a mean and a standard deviation. I'm, I'm claiming is, is that the uh, mean is uh, roughly what you see in that diagram that we, get, we talked about. And uh, as a result, uh, it acts as if it were locked in According, as according to Bohr in 45 degree angle, it acts, it acts like that because it's wobbling has a mean and the mean is about 45 degrees. Well, How can you say that? I mean, the, uh, the, the spin, I don't know, can be, when I think about spin, I think about wobbling. I mean, that could be any direction, any, any direction and any 360 degree sphere, really, uh, it's not, nothing is locked in into space. It's not like electrons have to be at a 45 or anti 45 degree angle. Maybe that's the part I'm not understanding. Uh, they could be in any uh, angle whatsoever. You're right, uh, Franklin. The Bohr claims, what, uh, and Derek, backed up by Derek, claims that that's the way it is. You get, you get 45 degrees and you take it or leave it. Well, maybe that's the part I don't understand because I totally choose to leave that, right? Well, uh, you believe what? What is that that you believe? Yeah, what does Bohr actually believe? It's kind of hard to... Well, I'm asking you, Franklin, what do you believe? Okay, so let's go back to the beginning here and... And my, my question would be, how many people believe the Stern-Gerlach experiment proves the quantization of spin? Do you believe that? I do not believe that. All right. I don't either. Okay, so uh, Dennis doesn't believe that. So that's the bot. Okay, anybody else uh, believe or not believe? I, I have a belief in it because uh, what's coming out of that oven is a randomly or orientated uh, atom or randomly orientated electron and the pattern doesn't show a randomness when it gets done going through that magnet it shows that it does have lock into one direction or the other so i say there is a quantization to the spin but is that a quantization of, of the electron is that a property of the electron that can actually you know 
be said to be something. <laughs> well, the, the, the electron spin can be orientated in any direction. That, that much is true. But with it, within the atom, there is a quantization of its spin. See, now that's the part I don't believe. I believe you that believe we can in quantization of spin or quantization of magnetic moment. Well, certainly you can quantize magnetic moment. I mean, you, you know, that's easily demonstrated by just taking a magnet, a bar magnet, next to any other bar magnet. And you can see that when you stick it together, it's either going to stick to one end and not the other. That's clearly quantized. What? Right. That's clearly quantized. You, the North Pole is only no, 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 no. That's totally quantized. It's not going to stick to the middle. It's not going to stick to the same pole. It's going to stick only to its opposite. So that's totally quantized. And that's the kind of quantizing, quantization we're seeing in the stern gerlach experiment. You know, it's either going to be attracted to the north or be repelled by the south. So there's only going to be two spots there. That's why there's only two and not three or four. You know, if there were four spots, then... Well, well I more. think we, we really need more experiments. I mean, you talk about whether we believe it or whether we don't believe it. Uh, there are some indications in the stern gerlach uh, experiment that uh, the angular momentum is quantized, but obviously there are some objections to that um, with regard to the atoms we used uh, versus electrons, uh, whether it's the spin which is quantized. But in order to determine this more fully, uh, we, we need further experiments. I think it's a bit fatuous well, to say, you know, I, I believe it or I don't believe it at, at, this, at this stage. We don't have enough evidence, really. I, I, I wonder what really the quant I mean, he, he doesn't seem to um, accept uh, this quantization. Or, or, or do you, Dennis, uh, accept the quantization of angular momentum and, and think that perhaps there are other factors involved? I wasn't quite. Um, I believe in the ground energy state of the electron, the Bergman and Allen electron, that the uh, angular momentum is uh, uh, h bar over two. Uh, but that's the ground state. Uh, if you excite the thing, it, its mass can change, its spin can change. Uh, but that, that's causative. You're, you're giving the reasons, I think, for the cause. Of, of what we see. Is that correct? Uh, you mean in, in my lecture or just now? Well, just now. Just, just now you've said this is the ground stage and this is what basically is bringing this about. Well, I'm just saying in my, our modeling it is. I didn't say it was in reality, although I do happen to believe that. But that, as you say, that's going to require data. Now I want to get back to you know the, the original reason why you, you came up with this topic, which was uh, you were saying that we have things like supercomputers, and but you you think that uh, so what part of making supercomputers you think relies on say quantum mechanics specifically? Well, if you talk to people, for example, I called up some guy at the University of Michigan at one point who was into. Uh, uh, do some kind of electron lasers. And uh, I, he, he kept saying, coming back to this, well, you know, there's only up electrons and down electrons. And uh, this guy, you know, as U of M and everything, this is not, you have to be in the current paradigm. And uh, uh, so uh, I think, if, you know, if you talk to these people, you'll find that uh, they start at, and square one is uh, up electrons and down electrons, and basically that diagram. Then they go from there. So uh, that being the case, why is it, why doesn't all their experiments turn out wrong? Why don't they come up with zip or crazy stuff instead of uh, computers and all that sort of thing? There has to be an explanation of this. And I offer what I said today uh, uh, by way of an explanation, namely that in, in a hot electron, uh, it's uh, not considered rotating around anything because then it would radiate. In a hot electron, uh, the uh, 
you would expect the thing to begin to wobble because of all the uh, infrared around going this way and that way, like uh, a gusting wind. If one minute it goes one way, another minute it goes another way. Uh, so that must be the reason because it, so if it wobbled, it would have to have a statistical wobbling distribution about of the angle that it's wobbling at. And uh, that uh, distribution would presumably be continuous and have a mean and a standard deviation. So if the mean is about 45 degrees and the standard deviation isn't too big, then uh, from a statistical point of view, you could assume that, that it's locked into 45 degrees, although it actually isn't. But for practical purposes, it would be. So I'm showing that I've got the wiki page here about a free electron laser. Yeah. Is this what you're talking about? I don't remember anymore. It's something electron laser, maybe free. Go ahead and uh, see who's uh, into that. Is there some guy at U of M that, uh, that they mentioned? But now the idea here is that you have an electron beam that's bouncing between uh, this arrangement of uh, magnets, and that generates laser light. Yeah, that's, that's, what, uh, that's not uh, the one I'm thinking of, no. Uh, the one I'm thinking of is, uh, I have a name here on my wall. Uh, oh, there's a continuation uh, of the Stern-Gerlich experiment where they put other magnetic uh, fields uh, of the same arrangement uh, beyond the initial one that you're showing, that once the electron is, is uh, split into one direction or the other, they... Uh, then put another magnet behind that and uh, see if the orientation changes. Much like in optics, we're using polarizing lenses. They do the same type of thing with the stern garlic experiment. That might be what you're referring to. And that would be uh, something about indicating more of a quantization or a spin, or that's where they were trying to uh, deduce more about the quantization of spin, whether it remained in one direction or the other. Well, well, here, I've got the, I'm sharing the page. Someone, here's the name of someone who was just recently retired. William Happer, H-A-P-P-E-R, of Princeton University, uh, top university. Uh, uh, he is, if you look him up, uh, you'll find what I'm talking about laser-wise, I think, because he, before he okay, retired. What's the name again? William. William? Happer, like happy, like H-A-P-P-E-R, a Princeton, and pre pre Professor Emeritus. Okay, let's see here. Seem to have, let's see here. Uh, He's also a big foe of uh, the guy uh, here. Atomic physics optics. Okay, this is definitely him. Optical spin pump we look for. We have laser guarded star. We have adapted optics here. <clears throat> I don't see anything about electron lasers. Uh, look under optical spin pumping. Yeah, let's see what that brings up here. Um, Optically pumped. We have something here. So well, maybe a book reference. Although, once again, I think none of those things are actually used in the production of supercomputers, which rely basically on the physics of semiconductors which is a branch of solid state electronics having to do with electron holes and doping of uh, materials and uh, that sort of thing. Well, look at uh, one of their big papers and see if uh, you don't see uh, uh, up electrons and down electrons talked about quite a bit. Well, I think you will certainly find that there's up and down electrons, but once again, I'm not sure that that concept is used at all in the production uh, or design of supercomputers. 
Well, yeah, the chips, it would be in the chip. Not really, because they really don't care whether an electron is up or down. They just care whether it's there or not. He's referring to quantum computing, which is you now a buzzword that people like to use. Yeah, so I was kind of wondering whether you meant that, because we do have these so-called quantum computers, where they do try to do all kinds of super crazy things, where they are actually super interested in the spin of an electron. Well, I have no doubt as to whether those things work at all. Well, I'm, I'm of the opinion that spin of the electron is a meaningless concept since we don't know what an electron is. And well, if you assume that the electron is a point, how does a point spin? It can't. Yeah, no, it can't. But uh, if you look at the Bergman Allen electron model, which is uh, the first, I believe that's the first three in the six files that Bergman put on. You'll see that you can make sense out of all this uh, craziness uh, using just classical electromagnetic theory and um, classical mechanics. Okay, so Cornelius, you had a you raise your flag, and then Slobodan. Oh, I think I was just looking more at the quantum spin idea, idea but I was looking at uh, the uh, if you just look at the Stern Gerlich experiment, like I said, in more detail. Uh, there is additional experiments that they did with additional magnets, but even if you look at uh, Wikipedia on, under the stern garlic experiment, you'll see uh, where they do, like you said, the uh, they have a graphics there where they do the experiment even with uh, just electrons alone. Uh, they should kind of show a, a little video even of how it divides up without the uh, nucleus in between of the uh, silver atom. Well, this is why I don't believe that they're actually measuring anything which is inherent property of the electrons. Because, like, suppose you use the stern gerlach experiment to separate your electrons into the up electrons and the down electrons. Okay. So if you then speed it into another stern gerlach experiment with just the up electrons, you will find that it will only generate a beam of up uh, electrons. And that's great. Okay. So uh, it's definitely getting something. But if you turn the stern gerlach experiment at 90 degrees to the original one, and then you put your beam of up electrons through it, you find out they split into another beam of up and down electrons. So how can that be? How can a beam of up electrons suddenly turn into another beam of up and down electrons? That's not an inherent property of the electron, obviously. It should, it should remain up no matter what direction the... the, 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 the place there, is. That's right, yeah. But if the thing's uh, wobbly, you can have a... I used to... There used to be toys when I was a kid. You could spin a, a top and it would turn over its axis uh, 180 degrees and then spin the other way. So uh, if you put in uh, up electrons, you expect to get out in, up and down electrons because you have a statistical distribution with two peaks, and, which are uh, up and down symmetric. And, and then, so the means of these two would be reflected in one being up and one being down, unless there was more than one mean, but that's unlikely because uh, 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 you know, for example, a, a, a cubic a meter of gas, when heated, the energy in it goes up as, as uh, T to the fourth. So, uh, uh, the, uh, lost my train of thought. Well, maybe slow it down. You had your flag up. Why don't you ask a question? You there, Slobodan? Okay, so who else has a question on this topic here? I'm still not sure I understand uh, what heat has to do with this whole thing. Heat is a randomizing. Well, if it's kinetic energy, Frank, if it's kinetic energy of the molecule, it has nothing. But, uh, and that's uh, according to classical thermal, that's right. But Kent Mayhew has recently published a book on uh, 
uh, thermo where he throws out the second law and entropy as well. And he points out that in his theory, which gets better data to, to compare some of the experiments in the old theory, he points out that in his theory, uh, the uh, cushions are not elastic mostly. So there's a huge amount of infrared or other radiation uh, moving through the gas as well, like a gusty wind. By the way, that's Kent, K-E-N-T, Mayhew, M-A-Y-H-E-W. So I, I think it's much simpler than that. I just think you need the heat source because the heat puts out a randomness of orientations and you can't really start your experiment to see whether or not they can become polarized or quantized unless you start out with something that's like an unknown a scatter, random scattering. If you already start out with something that's polarized well, uh, or quantized, then you're not going to be able to, to determine quant whether quantization occurred or not. Well, that sounds good, but suppose uh, under a certain temperature T, which is hot because this thing comes out of a furnace, suppose there, uh, the wobble angle, the average wobble angle, uh, let's call it theta, is about 45 degrees or reflected in the up-down minus 45 degrees. Uh, so the heat would then entirely randomize. It would, it would just have the reverse effect of uh, giving you an average uh, two, two peaks, one uh, symmetric to the other, and a standard deviation around each one, which again would be the same except for reflection. Uh, so you, when you say heat randomizes things, uh, you have to show, you have to calculate some numbers. Based well, on just, just, power. just take away the mag, just take away the magnet and look at how the projects on the screen. It'll read it, project it as a, as a ghostly image of a uh, circular image. Yes, that's right, because there's two components here. One is uh, these two peaks I measured, but these two peaks I measured uh, only uh, uh, are separated when it goes through the magnet. That's correct. And, and, uh, until that, this co what's coming out of the oven would be random, which is exactly what you want. You, you well, even said that, you know, it's just statistically right, you want I, a randomness. You're right, you're right. I was thinking of it coming out of the oven and going through the magnet. You correct. You talking about coming out of the oven, I, I apologize. That's correct. Okay, let me, can I make a, a little comment on this? Yeah. Okay, I think this whole issue has to do with what they mean by spin. Okay, what yeah. is a, what is spin? And um, you know, when they say spin, that implies that the object, this elementary particle, which is a point which has no size, is spinning. Okay, well, you can't have a point spinning. No. That makes no sense. So, what do they mean by the word spin? Okay. What they mean by the word spin is apparently like the polarization of an electromagnetic wave. Okay, you can have two polarizations of an electromagnetic wave. It can be left hand circular, which is one kind of spin, and it can be right hand circular, which is the opposite spin. Now, it turns out there are only two states of polarization of a wave. So, in my opinion, this is just not anything new. This is just classical physics made to sound like it's something exciting, like we've quantized electrons. No, all they did was they just showed that the that the electron has a polarization the same way that classical electromagnetic waves have polarizations. You can have two states of polarization in electromagnetic waves. That's all they did. You're, you're adding in spin polarized uh, light versus just linear polarized light. They're both two states of polarization, whether it's spinning uh, to the right, it's horizontal or vertical. There are only two possible states of polarization of an electromagnetic wave. So the bottom line is this has got nothing to do with quantum numbers or quantum effects. It has to do with classical electromagnetism. So the issue in my mind is they're claiming something 
that they really don't have the justification to claim. Basically, all they've done in quantum mechanics is extend classical mechanics, okay, and claim they've discovered something new when all they really did was extend classical mechanics. Now, there's only one state of polarization of a, of a, of a light beam, unless you're talking about spin polarized light, which is actually the coincident traveling of two light beams together. Well, I'm two sorry, that's just not correct, Cornelius. I mean, well, you know, sorry, you know, don't argue with me, please. Oh, heavens no, Harry, I would never argue with you. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay, I explained it to you. There are two possible states. In the satellite communications industry, we use this all the time. We transmit on the left-hand polarization, and we transmit on the right-hand polarization. We transmit two signals simultaneously on the same frequency. And you can receive them on the same frequency. And so, therefore, you can have two communications channels simultaneously on the same frequency because the polarizations are opposite. There's been polarized, polarized transmitter. Huh? Don't argue. It's a fact. It's been done for years and years and years. There's nothing to argue about. Well, I'm just kind of curious. It's a misinterpretation, Harry. That's all. I mean, it would be advantageous if there could be also uh, uh, some middle uh, polarization or some other different polarization. If you could get any other polarization, then you could transmit 365. Uh, you're only two uh, allowed. That's the point. But you're only allowed two, right? You're only allowed the left. You're only allowed two. Okay. So in quantum, what they say is, oh, it's a quantized state. There are only two allowed quantized states. Oh, and by using the word quantum and quantize, they make it sound like it's something new and unique and different. And it's not. It's just an extension of classical physics of electromagnetism basically applied to the micro world. And that's what's misleading about all this. Well, I'm not sure that, that this... Darren Gerlach thing is, is like that, other than it's... Well, they separate the two different polarizations of the electron. That's all they're doing. So you would have to be saying that the, the, that an electron is polarized just like uh, the EM wave. That, that would be kind of the... That's not exactly what I'm saying. But if you take the idea that it's a wave-particle duality, then electron, because in the wave description of the electron... It has a polarization as the wave has a polarization. But now you'd have to consider the Stern Gerlach, like I can take a left polarized wave in that case, put it through some other device, and get left and right polarized waves out of it. Well, they did something to the, uh, you know, they don't really understand what they're doing there, apparently, from what I gather. But the point is that this idea of calling it spin implies that you have this object that's spinning. A point can't spin and have it and have that be something physically meaningful because a point, you know, isn't a body that can spin. So, you know, there's an obvious contradiction right there. So what they've done is they've just basically made up a bunch of abstract rules based on, you know, improbable physical models. And then they say, oh, these abstract rules, we can apply them to nature, even though we know the model that we're using, that we develop these abstract rules from. Harry, I think, think you should just sense. stop talking because I don't think you know what you're talking about. No, that's you. Uh, yeah, well, I can just say the same thing about you, and I think I just did. So. Well, just yeah, be you nice to you. You're, you're basically conduct. being insulting. I said rules of conduct here, people. That's correct. Uh, you know, being I, I, no, yeah. I explained to you, you, you broke in and said what I said was wrong. Okay, prove that it was wrong. What you said was wrong because what you're talking about is you're, polarized, you're laying the antenna vertical and you're transmitting in that direction and you're laying the antenna horizontal and you're transmitting in that direction. You, you can also picking up with a vertical and horizontal orientated antenna the two signals, even though they're the same frequency, they're in opposite, they're in 90 degrees of each other. 
So that just that's just exactly you just proved what I said is correct. That's There's just a that's just a case of which direction. And you can and you can take an antenna and you can t angle it at 45 degrees and you can angle another antenna at 45 degrees. And if you're doing this out in space where the magnetic field of the Earth or the or the core of the Earth doesn't affect it, then you can put an angle in, at any of the 360 degree angles, and that antenna in the distance will pick it up the strongest signal if it is orientated in the same orientation. You can have Thank as you many angles as you I want. Said right. But it doesn't, what yeah, what you said is there are only two, Harry. Well, actually, that is true. I mean, we're talking about, this is in satellite communications used with satellite dishes, you know, and I've looked at these antennas and I, you know, I don't see anything oriented in like a vertical or horizontal. And if that were true, then they would be they would be able to use that to uh, to have more than just two orientations. But apparently there is only two. It, it and, and certainly what you say, Cornelius, is true about you know like rod antennas. So if you have a rod antenna that's going this way, the best receiver is also another rod antenna that's going this way, and the worst receiver is one that's going this way. And that's a kind there of there is not only two. There is only two that you can transmit with simultaneously because if you get too many orientations. The signal from one, if you get an angle that's 45 degree angles, the signal will be picked up by an antenna that's 45 degrees angle to that. It will just be weaker. The most optimized characteristic is when the angle of the orientation of the receiving antenna is the same angle as the transmitting antenna. It's the most optimized characteristic. And because of that, the 40, if they're not at 90 degree angles, one does not interfere with the other. But if, it, if there were any other angles between the two degrees, then the one angle would pick, the one mm -hmm. antenna would pick up some signal from the other. Yes, we already know that. I think what you're well, talking then there about are not there just two orientations. There are only oh, two. What you're talking about there is what is normally called linear polarization of radio waves, and that's certainly true. But there is definitely something screwy about this whole idea of circular polarization, which I'm still trying to figure out. And that's why when you have your 3D glasses in the movie theaters, they use they use now these circular polarized glasses because uh, when they're using linear polarized glasses, when you tilted your head, you know the whole screen would go screwy because it's only it only sensitive to those um, certain angles. But it, with with circularly polarized glasses, you can tilt your head and it still is able to separate out your left and your right eye no matter what angle the filter is at. So that's still a gigantic mystery to me how that works and and i think what harry is talking about is exactly this is why we only have two because the actual orientation of your receiver doesn't seem to matter in these cases but yet it would produce a hundred percent blocking of uh of the signal that's not in the correct uh, circular circularization um orientation so to use the word spin, I think they really mean polarization, and it makes more sense if you talk about polarization. And then what the magnet is doing is separating the two different uh, polarizations. But you notice that the result is a, like a smeared out pattern. It's not like you know um, a, just two dots, like a dot above and a dot below. You know, it's kind of smeared out, you know, above and below. So you know, there's, you know, it doesn't pick them out perfectly. So, but my my feeling is, is that this word spin really means there's two types of what we would call in the EM world polarization. Actually, I think even in mainstream, they, they always admit when we talk about spin, they always go to great length to say that we don't mean something actually spinning in space. <laughs> Well, it can't spin. A point can't spin. Really, really bad uh, 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 terminology because they, they they themselves admit it has nothing to do with angular momentum. Anyway, I've said my little piece. I think that's I think that's part of the confusion about terminology. I, I think it would have been much better for them to call it something else, like spot. Because well, but this it is what, spin. But it's spin. Why not call it spin? Call it what it is. Because it's not what's spin. Called? I mean, what's a, what, is, what is a one half spin? What is a negative spin? What is two thirds spin? None those, of those kinds that make any physical sense. Those spins are different spins, and they're related to the spin uh, with of a uh, particle pattern within a uh, atom, not uh, spin of an individual particle. 
There's a different, the different terminology, different usage of spin in that case. When you're talking about the spin of electron, you're talking about the orientation of the spin axis, whether it's vertical or whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. When you're looking at the, when you're looking at it from the yeah, but top, how can, the a, how can a point spin? A point can't spin because an atom, an electron is not a point. An electron is simply ideal as the point for mathematical purposes. It is not a point. It is a, a way. Okay, so now we're back to Dennis's point, which presumably there has to be some reason for why these spin thing exists. In other words, an electron isn't a point, and we need to have some kind of a physical model that explains it correctly. It's correct, but you don't use a point as a model. So well, you, still your still point about point. asking about how can a point spin is is uh, negated by the fact that it's not a point. It's not spin either. Really, seriously, it's not spin. Even in mainstream, they'll tell you it's not a ball rotating. It's just they, numbing. They will tell you that about the characteristic of spin when they refer to the spin of a particle within the atomic structure. They won't tell you that when they talk about the spin of a particle out on its standing on its own. Yes, they will. I mean, but all this spin stuff has nothing to do with objects actually spinning. Because it's just what, the result of the Stern Gerlach experiment uh, it, it is what spin really is. That's why what they always spin think means, out. What, what one half spin means is that when you look at something from halfway around on the other direction, it looks identical as to it did when you were looking. You can't tell whether you're looking at it from the one side or the other when you have a half spin particle. <laughs> and if, well, that's, that's, what, that's what spin you, means yeah. within an atom. I'm not sure if I've ever heard it that way. Well, just look it up some more. It's Everywhere I look up, it's it's all it is. is a, uh, a quantum property uh, not related to actual spinning. <laughs> that's correct. That's, that's that's what it is when they're using it referred to a property of a particle in an atom. Right. It's the same as they use color, too. But it's not a color. Yeah, right. So, Dennis, what what is the bottom line Final take on your presentation. Well, uh, the success of quantum theory both outside of nuclear weapons and uh, nuclear reactors, both of which I don't like. The, uh, the the real gravy in the theory is uh, has to do with this idea of up and down electrons, which is you, know, you call people up there. I guess you, I told you, I called that one guy at the U of M. So I know this William Happer. Uh, they're all using. They start. From square one, they start with uh, up and down electrons. Now, uh, why, you know, but but the up and down electrons, in my opinion, is crazy. Uh, uh, you know, you, how can a point spin and so on? Uh, just talked about but that. I, you know, if, but I and Dave Bergman have a model of the electron, which can be used, like for example, to explain the crane mass and magnetic effect. Can also be used to explain the Stern Gerlach, I claim, because uh, the heat involved in the furnace, with these silver atoms coming out, would there be, uh, since it's up down symmetric uh, in the diagram now, uh, it, would, it would tend to wobble like a top. Uh, where you might start out in the sleeper position vertical, but if you hit it with a blast of compressed air, a small blast of compressed air, it would start to wobble. And uh, that wobbling angle, as a function of the temperature and the magnetic field and whatnot, would have two peaks, one up and one down, and a standard deviation around, same standard deviation around each one in the distribution. But from practical purposes, Yes, uh, uh, that diagram is right on the average, and uh, this is this is their big experiment. If you talk to these people at different universities about uh, up and down electrons, they they're right there with the Stern Gerlach experiment, which, as far as they're concerned, settles everything. So, uh, uh, well, you're not convinced that the Stern Gerlach experiment proves anything. I think is what you're saying. Well, it. it it, it doesn't prove that the Bohr model has to be right, no, as uh, you know, uh, lifted up by Paul Dirac. No, uh, uh, because they 
And that's because there's a hidden variable here, and it's temperature. And uh, also hidden is the fact that you have to have a good electron model, which we feel we do. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, we can, it allows you to explain all kinds of things, like the crane monster effect and some other stuff, too. And uh, which, uh, you know, was so radical that uh, Monstein, uh, uh, they almost threw him in jail for it in Germany. So I'm just trying to load some of the other uh, documents that you had provided uh, for the presentation here. So you had a lot of articles from uh, the Common Sense Journal about the yeah. ring electron. Did you want to say anything about uh, those documents? Uh, How they're, they're relevant? Okay. It's, you know, that picture there, uh, figure one, is what the toroid looks like. Although it's so thin, you can think of it as a circle for most of them. Because the small radius is of order 10 to the minus 198 or 199, I forget what. And uh, uh, so, but the thing about it is that uh, uh, it's uh, in equilibrium. There's no mysterious uh, uh, Finding energy. Why doesn't it explode due to the strong, extremely strong column forces if the small radius is that small? Uh, well, it doesn't uh, blow up because the uh, magnetic pinch force around the, the toroid uh, exactly balances off the uh, column forces, not only outside at the surface, but also inside. So you have something that could actually exist in reality. Uh, that's what's missing in Bohr theory, it's not reality. Although they get good results with, uh, uh, for example, as someone pointed out, uh, quantum computers and so on. But, uh, and uh, also lasers, that's William Happer, for example. Uh, but the reason they get, uh, the good results is not because the Bohr theory is right, but because it, it uh, uh, coincidentally, you might say, if you believe in coincidences, uh, says something that statistically is true, even though it's not absolutely true. That statistically, apparently, when these atoms come out of the furnace, the solar atoms, their electrons uh, have two peaks. The distribution of their electrons have two peaks, one uh, symmetric to the other, and they're about at 40, the angle associated are about 45 degrees and then minus 45 degrees. So uh, they don't discover their error by experiment. They think they've got it locked in, in place when. Uh, uh, and, and they, if, for, if you dispute that, they, they uh, talk about quantum computing and so on, uh, or uh, lasers and so on. And, uh, you know, what do you just say to that? Well, yeah, that's all right, but I like my reasoning better. You know, I, it just doesn't sell in the world out there. The world out there wants results, things that work. So there's no explaining uh, the, uh, why the Gerlach experiment actually works in reality, except by introducing a classical model of the electron based on uh, electromagnetic theory, well-known electromagnetic theory, uh, that uh, uh, is uh, established. And, uh, you know, uh, showing that not only does it have all the properties, spin and angular momentum, spin angular momentum, um, uh, gyromagnetic ratio and all this sort of math, charge, uh, and, and furthermore, it, it can explain other things that they can't explain 
And they, the reason they, and they can't, we know they can't explain the crane monoxide effect because uh, they, they considered it so radical that they threatened to throw Monstein into the slammer uh, if he didn't shut up about it. So, uh, and they, they, I guess that court order still exists. So uh, he doesn't say too much anymore, but, uh, you know, fortunately, political correctness, scientific political correctness hasn't completely destroyed science in this country, but it's well on its way, in my opinion, because you can't get anyone to do experiments for you, so you have no data, because if, if scientists... If, at universities, for example, did an experiment that showed that I was right about uh, momentum not being conserved in that simple Maurice Colombe uh, device, you'd be out the door. You heard of what happened to Bill Lucas. Uh, they fired him the next day when he gave a paper and showed that SRT was wrong. So, uh, you know, all you can do really is theory unless you have the money to do uh, hardware type experiments, which Tom Phipps did. He was quite well to do. And he uh, built a Marinoff motor, for example, which uh, Maxwell's equations show definitely cannot turn, but it does turn, and some other things. But uh, the situation is not good out there. And it's getting worse every single day. And, uh, I, you know, it's hard to know what to do about it. Well, that's why we have our science chat, where you can, we can go ahead and talk about all of these forbidden fruit subjects, right? Well, for the time being, there'll come a day when, they, when you'll be, uh, uh, your, your talk will be labeled as hate or something like that, and, uh, and they'll just not allow you on the internet. So how do you like that? But, oh, that day has not come yet. Until then, we will take advantage of our freedom. Right? Yeah. Amen. I think it's I think it's coming our way. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be funny. It'll be like you know. Well, I mean, they're trying to do that. You know, they're trying to say that uh, you know dissidents are you know uh, you know just uninformed and. Yeah, they're. Climate deniers. Yeah, climate deniers. We're being, you know, science deniers. So, but yeah. that's what. But but here in the CNPS, we will always encourage uh, open thought. We are not beholden to the mainstream. So, but uh, we are getting towards the end of our talk here today. So I thank uh, Dennis Allen for uh, presenting us. So we, we've largely looked at this concept of this of the electron spin as described by the stern gerlach experiment. And we also looked at primarily this experiment where you spin the magnet and uh, it changes the magnetic strength depending on which way you spin it. So, so once again, uh, all the uh, papers that uh, Alan uh, shown here were included in the link that I had in the original um, in the original uh, um, announcement. And if anyone wants to have that, they can always email me, and I can I can also send that to them. That's really available on my website, frankly.com. I think it's slash capital D Dennis capital A Allen dot zip is the file where all these papers are, are available. But uh, that will do it for this week. And uh, I think next week, I think uh, I have a presentation. Someone wants to, uh, Mr. Ellis would like to present his uh, an idea. So, but I will, I will get that out in the announcement uh, next week. But that will do it for today. So thanks.